hello and welcome. Uh, good evening here on the East Coast. Uh, good afternoon if you're further west or um, if you're in the middle of the night somewhere in Europe or Asia, you're very welcome as well. It's a great pleasure to be able to re-engage tonight with the US Department of State on a very special award to one of its finest public diplomats in honor of Edward R. Murrow, who has a special connection to the Fletcher School. We have many Fletcher School alumni, board members, students, friends of the school, and advocates for public diplomacy in our audience tonight, and we welcome you all. Before I say a bit about the subject at hand, it would be difficult to be together today and not note something about the situation we find ourselves in globally, and specifically the war in Ukraine, the illegal war waged by Russia. These are unprecedentedly the dangerous times, not only for Ukrainians, but for Europe, for the Western Alliance, and increasingly by extension, as we look at food price spikes, fuel price spikes, and financial implications of global trade being so dislocated for many, many people around the world. And those who will suffer the most, as is often the case, will be the poorest and the most vulnerable. This kind of crisis, these kinds of wars are exactly why our school was founded in the first place and have been something that we have focused on through from our founding all the way through. We have, as is always the case, alumni at the heart of the crisis and alumni, students and faculty with very personal stakes in its quick and peaceful resolution. We have alumni, students and faculty working on the solution with multilateral agencies of all kinds and at the heart of government across the world. Law and diplomacy are at the heart of our pursuit of an impactful global scholarship. And we will continue to understand or seek to understand to illuminate and advise on how they can be used to build and preserve peace and to advance and extend justice for all. I'd like to take a moment to recognize a few of our guests this evening who are former recipients of this distinguished award. Michael Hammer, the US ambassador to the DRC and a Fletcher graduate. Donna Oglesby, who upon retiring from the Foreign Service served as diplomat in residence at Eckerd College. Susan Parker Burns, who most recent assignment was director for mainland Southeast Asia in the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs. William Rue, who held several ambassadorial appointments uh, and taught at Fletcher for many years as our Edward R. Mur Murrow Professor. Aaron Snipe, who is currently serving as the spokesperson for the US Embassy in London, and Benjamin Ziff, Deputy Chief of Mission at the US Embassy in Madrid, who is also a Fletcher graduate. Finally, I would like to extend a very special and warm welcome to the son of Edward R. Murrow, Casey Murrow, who has been a staunch supporter of the Fletcher School. I'm simply delighted that he could join us this evening. So tonight we examine public diplomacy and you will hear more about it in the conversation between former US Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, Tara Sonnenschein, who today offered her first workshop in public diplomacy here at Fletcher and the State Department recipient of the Edward R. Murrow Award, Laurie Nuremberg, Fletcher class of 1974. I'd also say that Tara, amongst all of the other things that she's juggling, managed to publish a fantastic uh, op-ed in the Boston Globe. So in true, in true Fletcher fashion, she's doing everything all at the same time. As many of you know, Edward R. Murrow was a reporter during World War II, bringing stories from the front, primarily from my home base in the UK. Using radio and later television, he brought credible news. He was the essence of credibility, something we all need in this chaotic world. And it's been striking to me watching the uh, war unfurl in Ukraine, that how many, how we, we rely upon the authenticity of the heirs of Edward R. Murrow and how many of them are women. We used to perhaps back in the day using, watching Christian Amanpour in Iraq, but now we have Orla Garen, we have Lise Doucette, uh, we have so many others that are the authentic voice helping us understand what is happening. What many people forget is that towards the end of his career, his life as a journalist, he entered government at the request of President John F. Kennedy to head the United States Information Agency. He said in his testimony to Congress 
that he believed America was engaged in a worldwide ideologic competition with communism, and that we will not be content to counter their lies and distortions, we will constantly reiterate our faith in freedom. That term, public diplomacy, was coined by the Dean of the Fletcher School, Dean Edmund Gullion, who was Dean of Fletcher from 1964 to 1978. Edmund Gullion served all over the world for the State Department and had become to believe in the value of what he termed public diplomacy. And he valued his friendship with Edward R. Murrow. So he created the Edward R. Murrow Center of Public Diplomacy in 1965. It was inaugurated here on the Tufts campus by Vice President Hubert Humphrey, and it remains here today, an active and vibrant place to understand how public diplomacy fits as one of the tools in the nation's toolbox. And so we honor the legacy of Edward R. Murrow, the legacy of our former Dean, Edmund Villion, who coined the phrase, and the importance of public diplomacy as we host the awarding of the Excellence in Public Diplomacy Award this year to one of its finest public servants. And to explain a bit about the recipient, I turn to the State Department's Jennifer Hall Goffrey, the senior official for public diplomacy and public affairs to tell us all about Laurie. Jennifer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel, Dean Kite. I, I appreciate that introduction. Before I keep going, can I ask my traditional question, which is, can you hear me? Okay, <laughs> then, I'll, then I will keep going. It's a great honor to be here today. Um, many thanks for the kind welcome and that reminder of Dean Gillian's and the Fletcher School's very important role in shaping who we are and what we do as diplomats. So many of the challenges we face today cannot be solved alone. Shared challenges posed by the climate crisis, global health and the economic impacts of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic, disinformation um, and authoritarianism, including, um, as you alluded to Dean Kite, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, just to name a few. We only need to look at the security and humanitarian implication of Russia's invasion to see that our shared challenges require shared solutions. I'm very grateful to the Fletcher School for providing a pipeline for young talent to help us achieve those shared solutions. While I'm disappointed that we can't be together in Medford this evening, I'm still thrilled that we can come together to celebrate the immeasurable accomplishments of my friend and colleague and Tufts alumna, Lori Nirenberg. We're here, of course, to present the Edward R. Murrow Excellence in Public Diplomacy Award. I'm very grateful that you and Undersecretary Sonnenschein, I still think of her that way, um, are taking some time to talk about the award's significance both to the Fletcher School and to the Department of State. Um, that means I get to focus on why Lori is so deserving of this tremendous honor. During her 22 year career with the department's office of the legal advisor, Lori has been the leading legal practitioner in public diplomacy through some of the most important changes in the way we do our work. She played a pivotal role in resolving the legal ramifications of merging the United States Information Agency, where she worked in the office of the general counselor for 17 years into the Department of State in 1999, providing invaluable contributions to the structure of our public diplomacy family, um, including the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. After that, Lori has been a consistent advocate in our efforts to improve on and expand the practice of public diplomacy. Our work is guided by various pieces of congressional legislation, and Lori has worked closely with our leadership for decades to help us understand what we can do and how we can do it, staying within the boundaries of the law and understanding congressional intent. When the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs designed the Academy for Women Entrepreneurs, um, or AWE, very recently to enable women overseas to improve their English language proficiency and business skills, Lori worked closely with department leadership and with private sec sector companies council to lay the groundwork for, for this very successful public-private partnership. Her, su her superb work in support of AWE over two years supported the program's growth in more than 50 countries. And when COVID-19 disrupted our ability to host in-person exchange programs, 
Lori worked tirelessly to help maintain, sustain, and adapt our exchange programs to a virtual format, ensuring we could maintain these important cultural and professional and ties among American and foreign publics around the world. On a personal note, Lori always answers the phone when I call, and she has an amazing capacity for quick and helpful research. And believe me, I call her and her colleagues a lot. Um, they have helped me through very thorny issues with other agencies and found creative solutions for us to engage American publics and stay in line with Smith Month and all of the other sort of legislations that we strive to adhere to. She helped us figure out how to get partners in Afghanistan to safety during and after the evacuation and how to support colleagues at the US Agency for Global Media very recently. Not only is Lori detail oriented, diligent and deeply knowledgeable, she's also patient with those of us, primarily me, who are less knowledgeable about the law. Um, and she is very passionate about her trade craft. Without Lori, the work of public diplomacy and the department would be diminished. Many contributions of the department's legal community to the practice of public diplomacy are not visible publicly, and I'm aware of that. But the department's 4,000 PD professionals rely daily, many, many times a day on counsel and collaboration with Lori and her colleagues. They help us make sure that we uphold the values embedded in the law about the practice of public diplomacy, avoiding propaganda, focusing on the mutual exchange of ideas, ensuring that private citizens in the US and abroad have an opportunity to engage and learn from one another. Professors at distinguished institutions like the Fletcher School will be learning about the implication of Lori's work for decades to come. I'm convinced of this. I am very grateful to have been able to work so closely with her and to see her keen mind in action. So therefore, in recognition of her significant contributions and unwavering dedication to the field of public diplomacy as an attorney in the office of the legal advisor, I am very honored to recognize Lori Nirenberg with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Excellence in Public Diplomacy. Thank you so much, Lori. We're grateful to you every day. Dean Kite, back over to you. Oops, I think you're muted. Sorry, uh, because we're on Zoom, you just have to imagine that this ornate and gold leaf embossed frame is being put into your hands, but it is my distinct uh, honor and privilege to be able to read the citation to you. Um, and before I do, I just want to welcome all the members of your family, of Laurie's family who uh, are online. They must be, you must be immensely proud of Laurie uh, just as the uh, Fletcher School is, and you've heard from the Department of State how important she is to this nation's pursuit of public diplomacy, and what an extraordinary contribution she's made. So the citation reads, Laurie Nirenberg, over a distinguished 30-year career in the United States Information Agency and the United States Department of State, has made innumerable significant contributions to the field of public diplomacy, as an attorney and advisor for public diplomacy in the office of the legal advisor. Her many achievements include playing a central role in resolving the legal ramifications of the merger of USAIA and independent foreign affairs agency of the executive branch into the US Department of State. Twice an exchange student, she has been a steadfast advocate for international education and cultural exchange programs. The consistent, unwavering dedication to advancing programs that engage citizens in international understanding serves as a model for effective public diplomacy. These efforts over three decades reflect the integrity, courage, sensitivity, vision, and dedication to excellence that Edward R. Murrow exemplified so well. Laurie Nirenberg, it is wonderful, and I hope that one day we'll get you up here on campus so that I can shake your hand in person or bang elbows or whatever we do these days. <laughs> um, but with that, I hand over to Tara, and who I believe is going to engage in a, a really illuminating, I think, uh, conversation with you. Thank you very much. Professor Sonnenschein, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dean Kai, Jennifer Laurie, congratulations. Um, and thank you to those behind the scenes who made tonight happen, the special advisor to the Dean, 
Jerry Sheeran, who's she and who's on the call, I hope, and Yanina, who put this together, and Mike, the audio, Andy Loomis at State, thank you, and uh, all the people at the State Department. First, Lori, let me just give you a chance um, to say hello to everybody. Um, this is your Fletcher School, and I believe you have some good memories, and I want to, before we get into the dark war parts of public diplomacy, just give you a chance to reminisce on when you were on campus and how that Fletcher experience was for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Dean Kite, Jennifer, of course. Um, I'd like to say hello to all my friends, family, colleagues, former award winners. I'm, I'm so, I'm really so honored to have received this award and I'm so honored that the State Department and Fletcher were able to coordinate um, this connection this evening. So thank you. So I was at Fletcher a number of years ago. I had a very good year there right after graduating from uh, undergrad. I had wonderful professors. Some of you will know and remember the ones I remember best were um, Alfred Rubin. I think the late Alfred Rubin, I think may have been in his second year of teaching and had come from teaching law school. And so brought the law angle to public diplomacy. Leo Gross was there, um, a number of other wonderful people, but there are, happened to be two that come to mind. And uh, it was obviously a formative ex academic experience for me and a social and cultural experience. And one last comment at this moment maybe will be how I've enjoyed in reading my Fletcher bulletins over the years to see that some of my overseas um, fellow students had become their ambassadors to the United States. I've seen how my US uh, fellow students have done wonderful things in a wide variety of fields, sometimes joining the foreign service, sometimes coming to the government, often in the private sector, nonprofit, domestically overseas. So for those of you who may be listening as Fletcher students, you are lucky to be there. For those of you who are Fletcher graduates, I, I hope that you have the same fond memories that I do. Let me stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Um, of course, I would be remiss, both of us, in not first asking about um, the situation in Ukraine. I believe tomorrow um, President Zelensky will address the United States Congress as he did the Canadian Parliament today. If ever there were something that defines public diplomacy, I think that might qualify, but I want you to define it in your own way so that everyone tonight really understands what we mean by this term. I would say that public diplomacy is our way of engaging both at the governmental level and at the interpersonal level with foreign publics in a truthful manner and sharing ideas, helping to explain the United States, its people and policies, its values, our belief in transparent, transparency, good governance, democratic systems, not only telling our story, but also listening to others. And uh, the definition can change um, from time to time, but I think those basic component parts are there. And I, you and I have talked over time about credibility and the Dean um, alluded to this atmosphere we're in where truth is under scrutiny, where credibility is challenged, where the confidence in the media, in government, in institutions is low. Say a word about this, this word credibility, which is so powerful to those in the field of public diplomacy. I would say that credibility may be first and foremost um, in terms of importance in how we convey ourselves and our messages abroad. We want people to understand us. We want people to believe us. We'd like people to see ways in which our values may be um, helpful to them, whether it be freedom of the press, freedom of expression or religion. So many of the wonderful things that many of us may 
either take for granted or uh, haven't had as many overseas experiences perhaps to see how, it, how things function in other countries. I mentioned to you the other day, Tara, that I had come upon an, an Edward R. Murrow quotation that I, I would like to um, just share with the group. Uh, he apparently said at some point or, or often, to be persuasive, we must be believable. To be believable, we must be credible. To be credible, we must be truthful. Pretty powerful it's words. A powerful reminder. And it, it takes us back to Cold War times when we were engaged in an ideological struggle over systems and beliefs and interests and values. And in that course of that conversation, the word propaganda did emerge. And it's re-emerging, um, sadly, but I think we have to understand what that is and how it differs from public diplomacy. There are some basic differences to be sure. One similarity is I think that definition has changed over time as well. I wouldn't say that all propaganda is bad, but I think it is also an effort to inform and influence, which public diplomacy is as well. I'm not sure that truth is necessarily at the heart of it. Some may be true, but I would say not always. I don't know that there's as an important uh, a listening component. Uh, and I think therefore one thinks of propaganda as a bad thing. And in some instances, it is clearly harmful. Um, in other instances, one could say it's an overly enthusiastic way of conveying opinions, but we certainly do make distinctions between the two. So when we look at what the D mentioned, tools in the toolbox of a, of a diplomat, a peace builder, a peacemaker, um, now it's social media as a prime tool. But if we go back in time, I'm always drawn to the story of radio, I should tell our listeners that Tufts, once again, has a very important history in radio. It was um, a graduate from the class of 1914 that built the wireless network um, in Medford at Tufts. It's quite fascinating, but I think there is still a power of radio, but take us back to this voice of America. <laughs> Well, let's talk a little bit about um, the post-World War II era and the early um, Cold War era when USIA, when the former US Information Agency was created. The Voice of America radio broadcasting was a part of that, as were a number of other ways for the United States and its people to convey our messages abroad. We had information centers and libraries. We had press publications, written publications. We had uh, exhibits, motion picture services. And the Voice of America was a way that many people overseas, because it was designed to uh, address foreign audiences, got their news, their objective news, got editorials, where opinions could be shared, got culture. I remember that there was a gentleman there by the name of Willis Conover, who was known worldwide for many years for introducing jazz um, around the world. Jazz diplomacy. Jazz diplomacy. So, um, the, and the Voice of America is alive today. Um, we, we now have, and we'll perhaps come to that later, but we have a US agency for global media and the Voice of America and other broadcast services still operate today. One of the things that Voice of America, and you mentioned it briefly, was this notion that we were speaking abroad in a different voice and way and with a different intent than we would speak domestically to our own audience. And that was actually enshrined in law. Speak a little bit about how that changed, and it does, of course, um, bring into for the internet, but that separation of what we said overseas to foreign publics and what we said to our own 
was separated. It's a very important point actually, and it will uh, perhaps through a discussion briefly of some of our legislation, uh, I can make some, some points direct, uh, that will directly address that. Using the word propaganda, there was some concern that the US government not propagandize the American people. Uh, there was also concern, I think, that um, we as a government not interfere with or try to take over the role of other broadcast entities. We became the, the international voice, but not necessarily, of course, the only voice. So one of the earliest statutes uh, dating back to 1953, we familiarly call the Smith-Munt Act. So many people uh, probably on this um, webinar uh, know, know that term, but that was the earlier of two acts. I'll mention the second one in a moment. And that under that legislation, as it was enacted, uh, authorized um, educational cultural and informational exchanges and experiences. And it authorized our telling the world about the United States people and policies. Over a few years, that act was amended and uh, one of those provisions was changed. And what we refer to as a ban on domestic dissemination was added. It no longer exists today, but that's how we refer to it because our messaging under certain sections of that statute was meant to be for foreign audiences. And so you might all be able to imagine that there would be certain messages or maybe the way we would tell those messages for foreign audiences that we weren't to be messaging to domestic audiences, it served a different purpose. And um, so there was that bifurcation Leon. The other statute I wanna mention before um, then going a little bit later in time is the, um, what's called the Fulbright-Hayes Act. And um, the late Senator Fulbright was, was behind that one in the, in the late 40s actually. And once upon a time, educational and cultural exchanges, which are uh, one of the main features and flagship programs um, under that act actually were covered under Smith Munt. But when, when Fulbright Hayes was enacted, they became a part of that statute, interchanges of, of, and people to people exchanges. So um, we have these two different statutes we have different authorities to a certain extent, we have different funding sources. But uh, to close out maybe this particular answer over time, the invention of the internet, you can imagine how difficult that makes it for us lawyers to be trying to counsel about, well, how with the internet do you say we address an overseas audience only? Or do we really need to? Or can we talk about platforms rather than the message? So. That's part of the challenge that my colleagues and um, face trying to, to you know, get social yeah. media, deal with social media. Well, you deal mentioned media. Fulbright and um, educational exchanges. You yourself, I know, were a product of one of those early experiments in international living. And maybe say a word about, I, I think it is just a continuous I, I find that people have been so changed by their experience of living overseas. I was very fortunate to grow up in a community with a very good public school system that did feature opportunities either to bring foreign students to the United States and into our local community or to send us abroad. And my siblings and I had different experiences overseas, both through our travels with our family and also to a certain extent studying overseas. So for me, my first educational experience overseas was between my junior and senior years of high school. And I was on what was then called the experiment in international living. And I lived with a family in Austria. My, um, my high school did not offer the German language, so I had two weeks of intensive German language training in Brattleboro, Vermont. My Austrian family, where I had two sisters, knew very little English, so we walked around their apartment, I with my English-German dictionary and they with their German-English dictionary. But after about eight weeks, we, we all did 
pretty well. That was my first experience. Um, fast forward, because of my love of that experience and my fascination by the German language, I went to Smith College, which had a very fine junior year abroad program in Hamburg, Germany. Not one of the more popular cities for junior year abroad programs, but I spent my, my junior year there. I was with Smith and other US college and university students in a specific program, but we were fully enrolled at the University of Hamburg. I lived in a dormitory. So that was my second experience and I could really see firsthand the, the values of um, people to people exchanges. And you know, Murrow has talked, talked many times about the last three feet in messaging. And so I just use that as an example when you're really coming face to face, sitting down with others, you know, with some language barriers, but my German got to be pretty good at that time. And certainly many people spoke English. So I think we could communicate pretty well. And of course, um, with Casey Murrow being on the call, Edward R. Murrow believed so deeply in bringing German scholars to the United States. He worked for the Institute for International Education. And it's all part of what we call soft power, a term that um, we give credit to Professor Joseph Nye. But these cultural and educational exchanges, I don't know if soft power is or still the right term because it somehow connotes that it's soft and that hard power is somehow different. What do you think? I don't know that much how, how often I hear of soft power, you know, actively used, but I would, I would say this, and I probably read it maybe by looking uh, up some information about Mr. Nye, but um, it, as a non coercive approach uh, uh, um, a, a, as opposed to you know, co-opting where we use things like culture and political values and foreign policies to help other people understand who we are and what we want and to help us understand them and to see if maybe they want the same thing. Um, I also wanna add um, just on a light note that soft power happens to be the name of the um, softball team for the legal advisor's <laughs> office. So we, we wear t-shirts that so say soft. Say wear t-shirts proudly. So nothing wrong with that. As we open it up and I encourage people um, and Yanina will help us put questions in the chat. I do want to bring us to today and the question of funding. Um, what we you were mentioning is um, a different agency title, but the same needs that Murrow begged Congress for years ago in his testimony, asking, please fund this function, this mission. And the names have changed. Um, you can talk a little bit about USIA or what it currently is called. I sometimes wish the names wouldn't keep changing because it <laughs> makes it harder to ask for money with um, new titles, but take a shot at it. So when I joined the government, I joined what was called the US Information Agency. Uh, after I joined, I think it was after I joined, but at some point that name actually changed to, or maybe it was right before I joined, that name had changed to the US um, International Communication Agency, US ICA. I think that was under the Carter administration actually. That became confusing and then it went back to USIA. But it is true that in the late 90s, over a period of years, there was a focus on consolidating a few different government agencies, either for, budge for budgetary reasons and or for practical reasons and or just administra administration priorities and congressional interest. And so in 1999, the USIA was merged with the Department of State um, and the position of Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, which Jennifer has held um, the delegated authorities for so ably over the last uh, 14 months or so, uh, that position was created sort of tantamount to the former director of the US Information Agency. Um, the broadcasting function of USIA became a separate independent agency, which was then called the Broadcasting Board of Governors and which is now the US Agency for Global Media. And I would say that at the time that, we were, that USIA was consolidated, some of the softer power components such as uh, arts, uh, cultural exchanges, musical exchanges, information centers, 
started to lose funding because they were the, they were the first things they were the low hanging fruit but fast fast forwarding now public diplomacy is an integral part of the state department i think most secretaries of state and you know administrations recognize that i think that while well, every agency every year is um, approaching and, and, and planning of what sort of budget it might need. And obviously these are subject to the administration's approval and OMB and the Congress. I do think there's a deep appreciation now for the work that is done in public diplomacy. There's a true love for educational and cultural exchanges, a real appreciation. There has been a merger of um, bureaus that handle both international um, informational activities and public affairs activities so that we can both create greater efficiencies but also realize that we are appealing to different audiences with different messaging so and i think um, i understand that maybe for fiscal year 2022 we have a budget a budget increase so we're always looking to expand and the demands on the client base are greater as people fully appreciate what can be accomplished through public diplomacy that can't be accomplished in many or any other way. Well, we're honored tonight to have a question come in from a real public diplomacy and uh, Fletcher alum, Sherry Euler, who asks as a Fletcher alum, and she is the president of the Public Diplomacy Council, really wants to know what the top priorities are today um, and what we encourage the US Congress to focus on when you think about prioritization today? Well, I think that um, priorities are still engaging with other audiences uh, on, on a personal level. But clearly, we have to look at the world situation as it is today. There are always going to be challenges um, at any given time. Today, we're facing particular challenges. So creating and sustaining mutual understanding trying to um, explain the values of a democratic system, public diplomacy messaging plays a role in that through uh, a variety of uh, different activities. And I do think that the Congress under, understands that, but we, uh, our officials are regularly on the Hill, either by request or being called to brief on um, priorities. So, Th those are the few things that I would I would mention. And we have a, a very specific question since you lived through the um, merger of USIA into state, whether any thoughts that there are on merging uh, USAGM into what we affectionately call the R family or the public diplomacy family. That's an interesting question. I don't know if I even know the answer to that. I mean, there are probably, uh, here, here's what I will say. There are probably, there's probably no end of thought that's given to a variety of um, different ways in which to make uh, all of the components of public diplomacy either more effective, most effective, most efficient. I think US AGM serves a useful, a very useful purpose at, at, as it is. But I do not, if there are conversations to that effect, um, I, I'm not personally involved in them. It doesn't also happen to be one of the areas that is in my portfolio. So there could be others who know more, but, and, and Jennifer might know something, but I, I don't. And um, one thing that um, has come up and um, it's advice for the entry level PD officers, and I, I do want to make the distinction between those who come into public diplomacy on a foreign service track um, or, in your case, on a, on a career track. So giving advice for the entry-level junior PD officers, um, I'll throw to you or to Jennifer, but it's, um, it certainly comes up as people think about that career track. Any advice for those would-be PD officers? Well, I'll start by saying this, pointing out, of course, that I'm not a, I'm not a typical um, PD officer in that I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I've come in in a different way. But I will tell you a little bit about the people I work with all the time. I would say that both the civil service and the foreign service are key, key 
components and family members that, and uh, locally employed nationals overseas who make up the public diplomacy family. So I work with um, uh, anthropologists, archeologists, Peace Corps, uh, you know, graduates of, of Peace Corps volunteers, um, such a wide variety of people with talents who have genuine overseas interests, overseas experiences. And I think that um, if you're, especially at Fletcher, perhaps I know a number of people would go into or attempt to go into the Foreign Service. And if you're interested in serving overseas and rotating around assignments and being lucky enough to be paid to learn different languages and experience the overseas experience, I would say absolutely consider the Foreign Service. I think the civil service component is equally important. Um, there are also opportunities for civil servants to uh, serve overseas in, uh, in some assignments. So those, that's how I would characterize those two um, sections in particular. But I also wanna just, just add that we also have this wonderfully talented contingent of um, uh, local support staff, foreign nationals that, who support us overseas and contractors, many contractors. contractors well. I was gonna say, and, mm -hmm. and lots of people who are either locally employed staff or, or on contract. We have a wonderful question from a wonderful, wonderful man. And I should also say some congratulations are pouring in from Peter Kovac and others. Um, but we have a question from Chick uh, Dombach, who's really one of the great peace builders of our time. And he asks about what you briefly mentioned about listening, that sometimes Americans preach instead of teach. Sometimes we, um, we have strong ideas about things and we forget about the conversation. So how do we make this act of listening a real part of our whole operation? I think maybe we need to remind ourselves periodically that um, telling our story is important, but listening to what others have to say is equally important, maybe in some ways more important. I do think that through person-to-person -person exchanges, listening maybe becomes an inherent part. Um, I also think that you know we, we bring people to the United States and show them around. We have a flagship International Visitor Leadership Program that the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs sponsors. We obviously have Fulbright exchanges, which bring foreigners to the United States. And I think listening, that's part of the, the beauty of those sorts of programs is that you place people beside their counterparts and they, they learn from each other. So, um, I think that's a, a, a basic component of, of many of the programs. We, we also, of course, do English language instruction. So where we are, we are teaching in that sense. But Absolutely. I think we always have to be, yeah, aware listening. of listening. Um, so we have a question which is really relates to Chinese media and um, how it is getting drawn in um, to the Russian narrative, but it, it does raise two very good questions. We're not the only ones in the world who do public diplomacy. Our conversation tonight is obviously focused on US public diplomacy, but Fletcher being um, an international training ground for international um, peace builders um, is also looking at the rest of the world, small states, large powers. And um, you and I talked a bit, um, the British, the French, there are many who do some form of public diplomacy. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to reflect on how our side of it, we've mentored other countries, but there's a lot of public diplomacy going on around the world. I, I, I agree with that. Um, we, we certainly have other major countries who have uh, institutes in the United States and around the world to teach their own languages, for example, and their own culture. You and I discussed the Alliance Francaise for France or maybe Goethe Häuser for Germany, whatever. We talked a little bit about um, the state of Qatar and last year um, uh, featured the United States in a uh, year of cultural appreciation. So I, I think that, uh, and additionally, 
we have all sorts of programs that we conduct overseas and which they, we share um, public diplomacy experiences and opportunities through a number of um, youth leadership initiatives. But so I think each country tries to uh, inst instill or those who are interested and open to it, try to do similar things to what we do on either a large, a larger or smaller scale um, basis, some more effectively perhaps than, than others. We have a wonderful question from a real PD superstar, Aviva Rosenthal, who worked in, in my shop. And Aviva went on to um, Smithsonian, and it reminds me of all the exhibits. You could go back to the world, world's fairs, um, but all the exhibits in which the US and other countries have tried to show their wares literally in American centers, in um, places to learn language. Can you say a word about those physical places, even in a time of COVID, um, that we hope will reopen, where you really get to come in and, and sort of touch America? Sure. I mentioned early on, um, back when USIA was formed, that we had um, information centers, and they the, these centers have had different names over the years, but they were places where local foreign nationals could come in and have exposure to either actually traveling exhibits perhaps that uh, came from the United States. Um, I remember there was one on jazz. There have been on any number of topics over the years. Uh, they could get access to um, US American literature. They could come in for English teaching or advising. They could come in for, for lectures. Today we have, um, again, this terminology changes from time to time, but we have American spaces, American corners, American centers overseas. Uh, they were sometimes there on US government property, sometimes they're on um, private property or host government property, but they sponsor a, a particular square footage where again, people can come in and get some exposure to U.S. culture and uh, English language. I will mention that USIA used to have an exhibit service, which was quite robust and put together um, messaging and exhibits that traveled around the world. We do now, of course, we're still involved in World's Fairs, um, Expo 2020 Dubai. Uh, yes, it was Expo 2020, but it's, it's, it's taking place now. That will close um, on March 31st, where we have a U.S pavilion. And we have, just, just to pick up on maybe some of, of Aviva's knowledge and interest, uh, ECA has a very robust cultural heritage center, which um, pr provides a number of programs for the protection and preservation of foreign culture um, and uh, cultural heritage. And any time that there is a conflict, um, we look toward cultural heritage preservation and uh, one program I mentioned in particular is the um, Ambassador's Fund for Cultural Preservation. So there are a number of ways in which we try to, we have learning centers um, we have had in Afghanistan. So uh, a number of places where we have presence on the ground where we encourage people to come. And they do, they do come when the local government allows us to have them open and welcome. Welcome. In fact, people. I know that one of your areas of expertise, and you've just mentioned it, is this whole area of, of cultural um, looting, cultural materials. And I, I look at Ukraine, and I know it's too early given the humanitarian crisis and the immediate war and peace issues, but I do think about museums, pieces of art. We saw this in Iraq. We saw it in Egypt. We saw it in many parts of the world where these UNESCO, these heritage sites, these important cultural artifacts either get looted or destroyed during war. And I, I wonder if in the midst of all this, um, it's something you and state are thinking about. Absolutely. I think we need to, we, we always need to think about human life first, um, but Cultural heritage is also very much the forefront of um, any assistant secretary's mind. The Cultural Heritage Center, 
the worries about the preservation of cultural heritage. On the one hand, it's important as a general matter to keep it in situ. On the other hand, what do you do if that, you know, in situ is itself in danger of looting and pillage? So there are, um, there are ways to help protect cultural heritage, but we have to, um, we do what we can while also, of course, focusing on human life, helping people evacuate or relocate. And the amazing thing is even in these countries where there is warfare, there are museum directors and those people who are risking their lives to safeguard a, muse a local museum or a particular site. So, but it is always, it is always on people's, on people's minds. Well, and it brings us back as we begin to get to the hour of seven to um, NATO, and Europe, and a continent full of artifacts and culture, um, and Russia as well, full of history, culture. And I think about what it is that Europe and NATO and the United States are doing now in this unified public diplomacy messaging which seems to me to be one of the headlines of this conflict is this notion of speaking with one voice at a time that is so divisive, polarized within our own country, divisiveness. And yet, I must say in the last few weeks, one positive has been this consent of the willing, however you want to describe it. But I I must say NATO public diplomacy with American public diplomacy, um, any thoughts on, as you hear, that unity of, of messaging? I think that's one of the strengths of um, what this administration is trying to do is to you know, coalesce a message where we can support each other and speak with, one voice where that's possible, certainly in terms of um, what we see happening. I, I wanna also introduce one concept, um, Tara, that I would be remiss in leaving out and an, an important part of, um, of the Office of the Undersecretary uh, for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, and that is something called a Global Engagement Center, which um, also just helps in terms of um, understanding, interpreting, and um, rebutting, if you will, and, and organizing and leading consolidated misinformation and disinformation, which is also a very important part of what we do, trying to hear what the messages are, trying to do what we can vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, pursuant to, again, our authorities and our funding, either the overseas audiences or even to some extent helping to explain to American audiences but um, so I, I think that just as the, the president is always saying diplomacy, we're willing to sit down, we're willing to talk. There's a diplomatic answer if we could just uh, get, get other sides to listen. But I, I would say that that's probably a somewhat common approach among us and NATO, NATO countries. Well, I know that there are many more questions, but it's always good to leave people a bit hungry for more. I think we could do a separate conversation just on terrorism and the role of public diplomacy in countering um, narratives that are, are dangerous to our security. I do want to, in closing, <clears throat> first recognize that it's um, Women's History Month. And so to have Jennifer and you and Dean Rachel Kite, I, it's really been a remarkable, the Dean mentioned just the strength of, of women in foreign policy and foreign affairs and diplomacy, how it's, it's grown and to encourage that. And I would also close on a prayer for peace for the region as the Ukrainian president addresses our American public tomorrow and whatever pleas he makes to us. Um, our prayers are always on the side of peace in these times. And so I want to, again, congratulate you, Lori, give you the last word before I say good night and good luck, which is what Edward R. Murrow would tell us to say. But any closing thoughts, the program will end where it began on congratulating you. 
It's been a wonderful experience for me. I have to say that um, I'm so lucky to have come into this area of, of, of the law. I am so fortunate for the people who have supported me over the years. Um, Fletcher was a wonderful start um, academically, but my, my colleagues in the Office of Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs in the Legal Advisor's Office, my clients. Um, so I, I've seen the world change. It's been a number of years. I hope public diplomacy will continue to thrive. There are constantly new and innovative people coming in both in the legal profession and in the public diplomacy world itself. And we all need to just look to our left and look to our right and realize we're all humans, regardless of our nationality. Presumably we all want peace and just finding a way to keep that conversation going. And for those of you, again, coming from Fletcher, it's just a wonderful, wonderful place to, to, to launch from. So I wanna ask Jennifer if there was anything. Jennifer, I anything I would give, um, you always give the boss, really. <laughs> then we could turn it back to Rachel, we would go all evening, but I will actually let you close us out. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Undersecretary Sean and Shine, which is what I still call you, as I said. <laughs> um, and Lori, I hope everyone participating in this call got a good understanding of why it is we nominated and gave Lori this award. Um, she is a tremendous, tremendous support colleague and font of information for all of us in the public diplomacy community. And as a, you know, I describe myself as a, as a 20 year plus PAO. And I know that there's almost no part of the work that I've done overseas that Lori has not touched upon in some way or another. But I only know that because I've worked back here in the office I've worked in in Washington for the past four years. I never knew it while I was overseas as a PAO. Um, and to the person who asked about advice for incoming foreign service officers, incoming public diplomacy officers, I think Lori's answer was spot on. Um, in my view, public diplomacy is the diplomacy of the future as we're seeing individuals and companies exert a tremendous amount of influence in ways that we don't predict on the global stage. Um, the job of the State Department is to keep up with in some ways and facilitate their positive impacts around the world and, and perhaps mitigate their negative impacts as well, but focus on the positive here. This is what public diplomacy professionals do. We have brought together people, um, Americans and foreigners for decades in the United States, and that is increasingly important today. Um, and to that extent, every State Department FSO becomes a public diplomacy officer. Um, so I encourage PD officers to really rise and take this moment and shine and other officers in the Department of State to understand the impact that public diplomacy can bring. Um, I think we are there. And I think the questions that everyone asked and, and of course the answers that, that Lori provide gave real insight into why the practice of public diplomacy has been and will continue to be important. So thank you very much, Dean Kite, um, Tara, for this opportunity that the Fletcher School provided us today. Okay, night and good luck. <laughs>